Heavenly Father, you send your only Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to destroy the works of the devil. And we ask that according to your promise, through word and sacrament, you would come with your power into our hearts and minds this morning so that you would bring us back from sin and from death and from hell. Redeem us to be your own, as you have through the cross of your Son, Jesus Christ. And keep us in that faith every day as we walk the way to life eternal. We ask these things through Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll sing him 526, which is the children's hymn again this week. service this morning is Divine Silver Study 2 from the Lutheran Service Book, and it's printed in the bulletin. Please arise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. The Lord is king forever and ever, the nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted, you will strengthen their heart, you will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, 
and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all, for to, all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We read Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6, responsively. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let him never be. In your, righteous, in your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. And your mind your to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked. From the grasp of the unjust and cruel men. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope. My trust, O oh Lord. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Our epistle reading is picking up the last part of chapter 12, the last verse, and going through chapter 13. And it's included in that last verse from chapter 12 because you might remember it was talking about spiritual gifts. There was a, a problem in the Corinthian congregation where they were way too interested in and obsessed with these various charismatic gifts like speaking in tongues and they were boasting against one another oh look at this gift that i have and so paul's talked about that a little bit and now he's saying i'll show you a more excellent way he just said earnestly desire the higher gifts and he's about to tell us what he means i will show you a still more excellent way if i speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel reading. Hallelujah! I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Hallelujah. <laughs> St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ah, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done no harm to him. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We'll sing him 731. <laughs>
We pray. O Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, rescued from the kingdom of Satan by the power of Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. The demons are here. The devil is at work, even now, among you. Just as he was at Capernaum, just as he has been from the beginning. For it says he was a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies. Jesus warns us that the devil it comes to steal and kill and destroy, that he is wicked and crafty and cruel. But fear not. For the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And that's what he's doing in our text at Capernaum. That's what he's doing here this morning. For by his word of authority and power, Jesus destroys all the works of the devil. He destroys his confusion, and he destroys his fear. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about misinformation. And a lot of people are confused about a lot of things because they hear different stuff from different people, and it seems like you have to be an expert to understand half the stuff. And most people out there seem to think that they are experts for one reason or another. And, of course, people can claim to have this or that or the other thing, and somebody else can claim to have the same stat or study and use it a different way, and people are understandably confused to some degree. Maybe it seems like that is the case with the Bible at times as well. You know, there's all these different churches, there's all these different denominations, there's all these different interpretations. And some people would have you believe that that in itself means that the Bible can't be trusted. They say, you know, if the Bible was really true and clear, then, then there wouldn't be all these different denominations and interpretations. But this is really a lie of the devil, seeking to confuse people about God's word and about his truth. He has long been launching a misinformation campaign against God's word to confuse, to muddle, to twist, to lie. And what he's really doing, when, when he gets people to think that way, you know, oh, if there's all these different interpretations, it must mean that the Bible's not clear, is the devil is telling lies about God's word, that's what false teaching is, and then he's convincing people that the fact that there are lies about God's word proves that God's word itself can't be trusted. And the reason the devil does this is because he knows that he cannot stand up to the word of God. Which is why Jesus comes teaching and preaching and proclaiming that word. And that word is different. People noticed. You notice the, the sharp contrast between the people at Capernaum here and what we heard just the other week about the people in Nazareth? They were uh, amazed in a way at first at his preaching, but we talked about how the thing that they liked about his preaching in Nazareth was the gracious way that he was speaking. And then they got mad at him and tried to kill him. In Capernaum, at the end, they begged him not to leave. And at the beginning, it says that they are astonished. And the word is really strong. I mean, they're like, just, they're like, their minds are blown by his preaching. And it isn't because of the style. It's because of the authority of his word. Jesus didn't go around saying, like, oh, I think this is what this means, and my opinion is, and, and uh, you know, so-and-so wrote this, and maybe it's that. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you. And that had authority, not just because he was confident. You know how sometimes if somebody's really confident about the way they're presenting something, they can convince you to think it's true, that doesn't necessarily mean it is. That's not what the text is talking about. Yeah, Jesus was confident in what he was preaching, but it literally says that his word had authority. The word itself had authority. It was different than other words because it wasn't a human word. This word is divine. This is the word that formed worlds. This is the word that can rebuke demons and silence them with a word. This is the word that can send fevers packing. This is the word of Jesus Christ. The word that calms seas. The word that has the exact same power and authority in everything it does. See, Jesus, in our text, we see him applying that word in various ways. But in every way, it always has the same power. He has that complete authority and power when he rebukes the demons, and they have to be quiet. 
tells them to shut their mouths because he will not allow them to confuse and muddle the truth of his word. Even though the demons say here is actually true, isn't it? They say, you're the Holy One of God. That's true. You're the Christ. That's true. You're the Son of God. That's true. The demons keep saying these things that are true, and Jesus keeps telling them to shut it. But, see, Jesus knows that even when the demons tell the truth, they're still lying. They're always trying to, to twist things. You know, it reminds me of this conversation I had many years ago. It was right around the time that the ELCA began openly ordaining uh, gay people as pastors. And uh, uh, I was working at a restaurant. I was in seminary, and there was a lady there who was a member of the ELCA church, and she and I used to talk. And she asked me what I thought about all this. And I said, well, what do you, what do you think about all this? And she said, well, my pastor says that they're not worse sinners than the rest of us, and that Jesus died for them too. Those statements are both true. Completely true, right? But her pastor was saying that those two things meant that it didn't matter. That they didn't need to repent of sin. When actually, in the Bible, both those statements are meant to call us to repentance and faith. Not just one group of sinners, but all of us. The Bible clearly says we're all sinners. But that doesn't mean that our sin is okay. It says that we all need to repent. And the Bible clearly says that Jesus died for all people, no matter what our sins are. But that doesn't mean that our sins don't matter. It means that they're forgiven. You, so you see, the devil is very willing and very good at taking true statements and then twisting them. And he's trying to do that here. See, Jesus doesn't want, first of all, the people to hear from anyone right now that he's the Son of God or the Messiah because he knows that they have false ideas about what that means, and it'll just feed into that. He also definitely doesn't want the demons to be the ones that are telling people that he's the Messiah because, I mean, that doesn't look great. That's probably not going to make people confident that he's really the Messiah. I mean, are like in league with this guy, what's the deal? And so he silences them with that rebuke, just says, quiet. And they have to be quiet. Then at the same time, that power of his word, which silences the demons, he also exhibits in, in his preaching of the word. It's not enough just to silence them, he also combats that false teaching by preaching the truth. And his word still has the power to do just that. You know, Paul told Titus and Timothy, two pastors, that they should always be ready to preach the word. That they should always be ready to rebuke those who contradict the word. To call out false teaching. It's a lie of the devil. At the same time, to teach the good word, that healthy doctrine. Paul tells them that they should pay attention to that doctrine because in so doing they will save both themselves and their hearers. And Paul praises the Christians at Berea because when he preached to them, they searched the scriptures to make sure that the things that Paul was teaching were true. That's the same word. has the same authority for us to, to study and to use. And in do so doing, we, we are able to destroy the lies and confusion of the devil because we have that same word. Now, in our text... There's three different words. There's that word rebuke, which is Jesus using the word to destroy the confusion of the devil, silencing them. But then there's three other words that talk about Jesus preaching in another way. It says that he comes teaching, proclaiming, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he emphasizes with that last one that that, in particular, is the reason that he came out. Now, now notice who this is going towards. Jesus never has anything nice to say to the demons. It's all, shut up. Get out. He also sometimes has to rebuke us. His law rebukes whatever is sinful or false or deceitful. And you and I isn't just the devil who tells lies about God's word. Isn't just people out there who do that. Our sinful flesh is doing it all the time, trying to mislead us. God's word rebukes that. But that's not the only thing that his word does for us. Constantly he is teaching and preaching and proclaiming that gospel. And he says in our text that that's what he came for. He says, this is why I've come. That's why I've got to go to these other towns, even though you people in Capernaum would love me to stay. And I'm sure that Jesus would have loved to stay there among people that wanted to hear the word rather than going to some other place where they might try to push him off a cliff like they did in Nazareth. But this is what he came for, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And by the kingdom, what he means is what he, who he is and what he does. The kingdom of God, that, that's, that's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
It's his rule at the right hand of God and his return to judge all things. It is the basis of his message being proclaimed throughout the world of the forgiveness of sins. And this is that power and authority of God's word that, that you have now. You don't have to be a professional theologian to have this. It's for all people. You need to only hear that word, read it, meditate on it, pray it, trust it. Don't be lazy about this, leaving it to others to find out what it says. Don't be hasty about this, naively going along with whatever anyone else says. It says. It said be firmly and deeply rooted in that word. And, and when you are, you can proclaim that word the way Jesus did. Not truly, truly, I say to you, but thus says the Lord. When you find out from the Bible what God has said, then you can tell what God has said. You can preach that word of authority that destroys confusion and all the lies of the devil and also destroys fear. So you're out for a hike and uh, you run into a mountain lion. It's big, it's mean, it's snarling at you. You have three choices. Well, number one, you can run away. Number two, you can attack it. Number three, you can back away slowly, facing it while making loud noises. Which one's the right choice? Definitely not the first two. Those are really bad ideas. See, the lion is afraid. It also doesn't entirely know what you are. But if you run away from it, its predator instinct comes into play and it's gonna chase you down and try to kill you. If you attack the lion, well, remember, it's afraid. And you're in its territory. And it's gonna be fighting for its life desperately, defending itself, it's gonna attack you. And it's probably gonna win. I did see a video once, though, of a guy doing that third thing. He was out for a run in the mountains Boom, there's this big mountain lion. And he had, he had his cell phone with him. He took a video of the whole thing, and he's backing away slowly. He's shouting at it. He's making himself look big, and he's clapping his hands together. And, and that lion followed him for like a while, like, like a mile or something. And it would growl at him every now and then. It would kind of rush a little bit at him now and then, but it never attacked because it didn't actually want to attack. It's afraid. It just wanted the man to leave its territory. So he did, but without running away, making it think that he was prey. I think this is a really good way to understand what the devil and the demons are. They're wild, angry, desperate, cornered animals. Peter calls the devil a raging and roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And the book of Revelation says that he has come down to earth with great wrath, for he knows his time is short. Meaning... He is furious at God and at his church because he knows that he has been defeated and that Jesus is coming to send him and all the demons into the eternal fire of damnation. That's why the demon in our text says, Jesus, have you come to destroy us? You know he has, bro. The real question here that the demon is asking is, like, you're going to send me to the pit now? And another place the demon says to Jesus, have you come to send us to the pit before the time? They're afraid of that. They're terrified of that coming. So they're cornered, and they're angry, and they're snarling. And this is their territory. Or at least it was. See, Jesus says that this, the, the devil is the prince of this world. There's this one interesting exchange in the book of Job where the devil appears before God, and God's like, where have you come from? And the devil says, from going back and forth upon the earth and from walking to and fro upon it. In other words, I'm doing whatever I want. Because in this world, there is so much sin and death and fear. And this is what the devil uses to rule his kingdom. Wherever these are found, there is the devil's territory. Jesus said that the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He's, of course, talking about when he lied to Adam and Eve about the fruit. He did that in order to kill them, spiritually and physically and eternally. He wanted to destroy their relationship with God. He wanted to make them enemies of God. He wanted them to be with him under his dark domain. He wanted to bring all the curse of sin, of death and hell and fear upon people. And it's through these things that he rules. It's through these things that, that he tempts and terrifies. You know, so many of the temptations that you face 
are based on fear. It might tempt you to, to do something, to take something, to get something because of a fear of missing out. Well, what if I don't get what that person has? What if I don't enjoy my life the way this person did? Because you know, oh, this life is all we got. That's a lie of the devil. Or he'll say, uh, use the idea of a fear that someone else will do something to you. You know, how many like wars and arguments are started because one side is afraid of what the other side might do, and so then they do it themselves. Fear is often the basis of temptation. There's another lie of the devil that's very common these days, which is based on the same sort of fear. You've probably heard people say something like this before. They'll say, um, you know, if there's really a good God, how can there be so much pain and suffering? There must not be a God because there's pain and suffering. That's a lie of the devil, too. And you know what it's a little bit like? Imagine that lion again. You got that lion, Mount Lion cornered. And uh, imagine in this scenario, you have a big gun with which you could blow that lion into pieces. And the lion knows it and he can talk. And the lion says to you, hey, come here. Put down that gun. I mean, how good could that gun really be if it let you get into this dangerous situation to begin with? You can't trust that gun. And then while you're sitting there thinking about whether the lion might be right and, and about whether you can really trust the gun, he pounces on you and destroys you. That's what the devil's doing with that lie. He's saying, oh, look at all this pain and suffering. You can't possibly trust the one who promised to destroy the pain and suffering. That's that lie of the devil. Is there something else I can help with? So the demons, the devil, they're like this cornered animal. They know they have no power. They know Jesus is this loaded gun, that his word has this power that they cannot stand up to. And this is why they, they always try to put on such a show. You know, they're always making a scene. Like the, the one in our text, he throws this man down in the midst of the people. We have other examples where they're crying out and screaming and all kinds of weird stuff. The reason that they're doing that is because they are afraid. Because here Jesus has invaded their territory. And they cannot do anything against him. They're showing their teeth. But their teeth are dentures. Jesus has destroyed all of their power and they know it. And so they are faking. They are bluffing. They want to make you afraid. Because that's all they have. They want to make you afraid of the sorrows and troubles and fears of this world, and it's all a smoke screen. They have nothing that can stand up to Jesus' word. We have the perfect examples of that in our text. This man who was possessed, Jesus ordered the demon to come out, and he had to. He throws the man down in the midst, and then he comes out. But you notice what it says? The man was completely unharmed. I guarantee you that was not because of the goodness of the demon's own heart, that the man was left unharmed. It was because Jesus wouldn't allow him to hurt him. And then Jesus went to the house of Simon, and his mother-in-law had, had a high fever. It literally says she was being tormented by a fever. It's really bad sickness. And he stands above her, and he, he rebukes the fever. The same way they rebuke the demon, and faster than a lion can pounce, the fever is gone. And she is perfectly fine. Gets up and starts serving him. Now, the suffering, the, the, the danger that that man was possessed and that Peter's mother-in-law faced for a time was certainly real. And yet, because Jesus healed them, there was nothing in that danger to fear. He's already destroyed the works of the devil. Just as he rebuked this demon and sent it packing, so by his death and resurrection, Jesus has rebuked, destroyed, derided, and demolished all the powers of sin and death and hell. He has taken that curse, that curse of sin upon himself, and removed it forever. All the things the devil uses to try to hold souls and through all to him have been removed by Jesus. The guilt, the fear of death and damnation, they're gone. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has destroyed the devil's lies. He has destroyed his fear. All that's left for the devil to do is 
bare his fake teeth. So as Paul says in Corinthians, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Do you realize that Paul is mocking death? He is dancing on death's grave because of what Jesus has done to destroy them. It means that all the powers of hell are now all bark, no bite, a cap without claws. So when the devil tempts you to fear because of sin or death, when he tempts you to be afraid because of the troubling things happening in the world or because of what might happen if this or that comes to pass or because of your sins, remember that when it comes to the devil, it really is true that the only thing to fear is fear itself. Jesus' word destroys all that the devil does. The proclamation of the gospel has ripped out his teeth and broken all his strength, and it means that all that we suffer now is only temporary. Just like with Peter's mother-in-law and that man who is possessed, Jesus will shortly heal you when he raises you from the dead. And since he's going to raise you by the power of his word, what is there in any of, the, uh, any of this to fear? So yes, as I said at the beginning, the demons are here. They are working. They're trying to confuse you. They're trying to mislead you. They're trying to terrify you. They think this is still their territory. But wherever Jesus' word of authority comes, there also comes his kingdom and his power and his forgiveness. And that means there's nothing to fear. Jesus' word has still its ancient power, the power of the Godhead, the power of his holy blood and his glorious resurrection you got something much bigger when you face this lion than a loaded gun. You have the word of Jesus. The word which rebukes the devil, which destroys his confusion and lies, which destroys his fear and gives you life and faith and, and joy eternal in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise. We'll confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We'll pray. Heavenly Father, who through your gospel has destroyed all the works of the devil, we praise you for the blessing of forgiveness through your Son, Jesus Christ, and we ask, Lord, that you would always keep us in that true faith that you would fill us ever with your word and your spirit, that you would never forsake us and so protect us from all the dangers and troubles of this world through your word, which gives us confidence, and through your word, which, which gives us the power of forgiveness and life. We ask, Lord, that you would give us boldness and zeal to, to tell people about this gospel and this word, that you would give us love to, to live out this word in our lives and all the vocations you have given us, to live without fear, with joy in your forgiveness and life and all that we do. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us in all of the various callings that you have given us, that, that we would serve you and serve one another. We ask that you would bless our community and our country and the world, that you would give us wise leaders, that you would give to us understanding and generous and peaceful hearts. 
We ask that you would bless the proclamation of your word by our congregation here, by all our churches, and by all your holy Christian church throughout the world. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon all those who are sick, or suffering, or sad, or hurting. We pray especially for Don Bigfoot. He's been having a lot of problems with his tremors, as he has for a while. We ask that according to your will, you would grant understanding for the, for the doctors to help him and his body and give him healing. And most of all, Lord, that we grant that you would give him faith and trust in you. We also continue to keep Kaylee Uni in our prayers. We thank you for the, for the growth in her body that you have given her and so far. And we ask that you would continue to do so as she struggles uh, with, with many difficulties in her life. We ask, Lord, that you would also bless jo uh, Gloria Longwitz and Carol Gilbertson, who cannot be with us today, and all those that we remember in our hearts before you. We ask all of these things, confident that you will hear us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God. Amen. We'll continue with the offer. good, right, and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For what had been hidden from before the foundation of the world, you have made known to the nations in your Son. In him being found in the substance of our mortal nature, you have manifested the fullness of your glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and saying, sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O God, be all glory, honor, and worship of the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Take and eat. This is the true body. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Now may this, the true body and true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in the true Christian faith and life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace. Take heed. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Given to death for your sins. Rise. We'll sing Thank the Lord on page 12 of your bulletin. to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Sing him six hundred and sixty six. <laughs>
sharing the good news of salvation, you know, there might be an argument to be made that Siri has a demon because <laughs> that demon came into the middle of the synagogue and tried to interrupt Jesus when he was preaching the word. That's what she just did. I don't know what I'm saying, but... <laughs> Um, the Sunday school and Bible class shortly after the service. Thank you, Mike, for playing. And not this Tuesday, I suppose, right? But next Tuesday would be council meeting. Mm -hmm. Next Tuesday. No, today's the sixth. Oh, yeah, this Tuesday, council meeting. Yes. That reminds me, we're we have not quite finished the book. I'll talk to you in a second about it, Mark. We have a book we've been going through. Um, and so I was going to bring a copy to give you. But didn't. So I'll just let you know about it, right? Um, so you're not totally in the dark. But. The piano! <laughs> All right, well, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with each of you.